um, good afternoon or good morning, depending where in the world you are. Uh, so the UK Quantum Fluids Network webinars are back. Had uh, quite a big break, summer break, and now nearing near Christmas time, and uh, we're back with a speaker from Nottingham University. Uh, Patrick Schwanchara, and he's going to speak about simulations of uh, black holes in superfluid helium. So over to you, Patrick. Thank you, Dima. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak at the, at the webinar series. Uh, so uh, this work is actually done in collaboration with uh, our students Pietro Leonardo, Postdoc James, and our PI Silke from the University of Nottingham and uh, our colleagues from King's College, Sam Patrick and Rose Gregory, and uh, Carlo Barenghi from uh, Newcastle University. And what we are, uh, what I'm going to speak about is actually our exploration of quantum field theory dynamics in rotating curved space times. So, uh, I'm trying to switch slides, perfect. So uh, first question, how can we make actually a curved space time in a laboratory? Naturally, uh, it would be dangerous to make a, an actual black hole or something that is actually generating a curved space time uh, in, 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 a, in an experiment in a laboratory in the, on the Earth. But we are lucky because there is a whole class of systems called gravity simulators where fluctuations can be described by an effective field theory that uh, lives in a curved space time. And uh, mathematically speaking, our job is actually to take well, any wave equation that is descri describing the dynamics of these fluctuations and rewrite it under some assumptions to what is called the klein gordon equation that describes the dynamics of a massless scalar field in a curved space-time, and the curvature of the space-time is given by this term, GAB, which is called also the acoustic metric. And this metric depends on C, which is the propagation speed of our fluctuations, and V, which is the velocity field of the background medium. And uh, speaking about the wave equation, well, there is there are lots of systems where this mapping from uh, fluid dynamics to uh, gravity can be can be actually achieved. So first one is just using sound waves, so Navier-Stokes equations. We can also take a pair of coupled Navier-Stokes equations, and we can actually treat uh, the interface between, for example, uh, a, a liquid and a vapor above it as this gravity simulator. We can go to the quantum world. We can treat a Bose-Einstein condensate, so the gross pitevsky equation as an effective Klein-Gordon equation. And finally, and which will be uh, the focus of this talk, is actually this dynamics applied to superfluid helium-4. So experimentally, uh, over the past, say, 20 years, there was actually a boom of different actual experimental realization of some concrete curved space-time scenarios on tabletop experiments. So let me start with the first idea that is 40 years old, expressed by Bilunru in 1981, who considered supersonic waterfalls. So imagine that there is a flow of a fluid. I hope you can see the animation. So there is a flow of fluid that is speeding up. And at some point, uh, this fluid becomes supersonic. So if you, an, if you have an observer, standing at the top of uh, this, this waterfall and is trying to probe what is happening to this emitter uh, that, is, that is sitting in the supersonic region, he can't actually reach any information from that region because this emitter sits behind uh, an effective black hole horizon. But naturally, uh, realizing you know, supersonic flows in, say, water might be a bit of a challenge, but a uh, second uh, suggestion uh, actually came very handy because the same kind of mathematical apparatus can be can be uh, built for surface or gravity waves on fluid interfaces where the propagation speed is actually decreased by many orders of magnitude. Uh, besides classical system, but besides, besides classical systems, we have uh, actually a plethora of quantum systems where uh, some analog uh, gravity uh, scenarios were successfully realized such as Bose-Einstein condensate, exciton polariton systems, uh, superfluid helium-3, 
and some nonlinear optical media where the superfluid or where the quantum fluid is the, the quantum fluid of, of light. In our case, I'm going to focus specifically on rotative curve space times. So these, because of the rotation, require two spatial and one time dimensions. And uh, they have actually real world applications because these rotating curve space times for, can, for example, simulate rotating or curved black holes, which are the most common black holes in our universe. And uh, we are actually quite lucky because uh, these black holes or the space time metric uh, that is describing these black holes can be simulated by a rather simple, uh, simple, simple flow that is actually realized all around the globe every day because it is a simple uh, draining or a bathtub vortex. So here is a snapshot uh, of such a vortex. Uh, basically, you create it by filling up a tank with uh, a fluid and then you open a drain somewhere and you let the water drain out. And uh, if you consider the interface, uh, you have two velocity components. You can have a radial velocity component. And uh, if your radial velocity increases the propagation speed of surface waves, you create an effective black hole horizon in the system. But if your total velocity, so the sum of radial and azimuthal components exceed the propagation speed, you can also create uh, an effective ergo region to actually give the full analogy between this flow and rotating black holes. There are some restrictions though. So the mapping requires that the velocity field is irrotational. So the, the curve is zero everywhere where you want to use the analogy. So ideally we want both velocity components to scale as one over uh, radius. And uh, practically speaking, this means that we need to take all the rotational components and uh, stack them somewhere close to the drain in what we call a vortex core. And when we do all of that, we can start probing some predictions of uh, general relativity. So for example, uh, these systems help to uh, measure directly, uh, for example, super radian amplification or black hole ring down, which is a process where a perturbed black hole uh, radiates its energy getting to equilibrium. Uh, and uh, this is actually something very relevant to recent observations of gravitational wave signals because these ring down modes can be directly read from these gravitational waves. So before I started my postdoc two years ago in Nottingham, actually all these systems, uh, all, these, all these measurements have been realized uh, in this uh, quite impressive uh, experiment that was built in Nottingham for uh, more than 10 years, which is basically a big tank filled with dyed water with some exchangeable uh, central drains and uh, with some recirculation circuit that leads the system towards a steady state. But my job here in Nottingham was actually to transition uh, the system, the simulator from classical to quantum fluids. And our quantum fluid is superfluid helium-4 or helium-2. The reasons are several. One of them is that uh, superfluid helium offers much lower viscous dissipation than water, for example. And uh, due to the quantization of circulation, it offers a potential flow around individual quantized vortices. So a requirement of irrotational flow uh, to provide uh, you know, the mapping uh, for, for, for analog gravity could be somehow simpler. We just need to create a big vortex in superfluid helium, which will be potential. Unfortunately, multiply quantized or giant vortices are um, famously unstable. They break into individual quantized vortices. And uh, uh, an alternative would be actually to work with a cluster of singly one vortices. But again, how can we confine them? This single, these clusters of singly one vortices have the tendencies to actually go uh, apart from, from, from each other. So there are several questions that we need to actually address before, before, before we can, we can you know, uh, do experiments. So we actually had a look into uh, available literature and uh, we found that actually there is quite an extensive literature on how to stabilize uh, dense vortex clusters or multiply quantized vortices in quantum fluids. And there are some ingredients that we can be somehow guided. So for example, reducing density in the vortex core helps. Uh, adding a draining velocity component into your, into your fluid flow helps. 
and uh, also uh, working at, at a finite temperature in the two fluid regime where we have a substantial amount of normal component helps because the back action of the normal components helps to stabilize coherent and large uh, vortex clusters in superfluid helium. Here is an example how these things can be combined. So this is actually a two-dimensional uh, simulations of a simulation of a two-dimensional superfluid uh, with a central region of uh, decreased density. And as you can see, actually in the simulation, they started with uh, several individually singly quantized vortices around 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 vortex, and uh, and these vortices were dragged into into this uh, density depleted regions, fused with this region, and eventually formed a giant multi multi multiply quantized vortex. And we want to use a similar approach. So what we, what we want to do is actually we want to work in superfluid helium with free surface and at finite temperature. And what happens was already studied before uh, by the Osaka group. And the idea is that as you start forming a draining vortex uh, in a container of, of helium-2, you'll start getting uh, the central depression at the interface. And this, 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 this depression will start uh, attracting quantized vortices. And moreover, quantized vortices can actually merge with the depression rendering it as a multiply quantized object. So let's jump into the experiments. So our vortex generator uh, is actually inspired by a series of successful experiments uh, from, from Osaka, where they realized what is called a suction vortex. So the key component is a rotating propeller that acts as a centrifugal pump that is, that is going to create one direction of flow of helium in the crustat. Uh, the rotation is actually provided by magnetic coupling with the room temperature drive. And the novelty is actually this use of a bespoke 3D printed flow conditioner, which has uh, two roles. So one role is actually to stop or to decrease the amount of solid body rotation that is induced by the rotating propeller as we recirculate superfluid helium from the vicinity of the propeller to the upper region, uh, what we call our experimental zone, where the draining opening is located at the top of our flow conditioner. And this uh, experimental zone or the experimental area is where all the interesting uh, stuff is taking place. And when everything works correctly, a draining vortex form in this, in this region. So partly because we wanted to have a good uh, optical access to the system so that we can actually control how a vortex is forming, and partly because we needed uh, to implement uh, our magnetic drive of the propeller, we enclosed our experiment into a pair of uh, fully transparent uh, glass jewels. So far, we conducted experiments in 1.95 Kelvin, which is a temperature where we can very com comfortably get to and stabilize uh, with uh, you know fluctuations of less than one millikelvin, and we can tune the propeller speed with a smooth operation somewhere between 0.5 and 3.5 hertz. And actually, this tunability is around to be quite uh, crucial in our experiment, because if we choose a small propeller speed, say 0.5 hertz, what we observe is actually a small surface depression. So I'm trying to play a video. I hope you can you can see it. But here, when I'm trying to point with my laser pointer, here is just a small dimple at the surface of the superfluid, and the much of the vortex core is actually filled with 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 a uh, uh, superfluid helium, and with what we believe are individually quantized vortices, and we call this regime a solid core. But if we increase the propeller speed, uh, what happens is that the depression actually extends all the way down to the down to the drain in our system, and uh, actually a fully developed hollow core uh, uh, is, is created uh, in our system. Uh, naturally, this is actually a new experiment, and uh, we would like to understand what is the det detailed structure of the vortex core how quantized vortices are, are arranged near to the, to the, to the depression, whether uh, this flow, and most, most importantly, whether this flow is irrotational elsewhere uh, outside of the vortex core, because this is one of the key uh, requirements 
to use the system as a simulator of, uh, of a curved space time. And for this, we need a good enough spatial resolution in our system so we can probe the vortex angle uh, you know, as a function of the radius, for example. What we, what we uh, introduced uh, to reach this goal is a minimally invasive method, which is just based on the dynamics of interface waves. So our interface waves are following a dispersion relation with this dis dispersion function that is a function of, of, of a gravitational acceleration, surface tension, density, and the depth of the superfluid. But because of some flow at the interface, these frequencies of our interface waves are frequency shifted because of this velocity dependent term. And uh, I'm going to show you how we can actually use the shifts in the frequencies to determine what is the velocity field in our setup. But before we can do that, we need to detect these waves. And for the interface detection, we need uh, a method that is going to provide us high resolution and uh, uh, well, high sensitivity to, to discern uh, these small waves that are generated on the superfluid interface and high resolution both in space and time. This is why, although our experiment is you know, made of glass and it's fully transparent, we also have uh, op optical access from the top of the craft stat, and we can actually observe the training vortex here represented by this small dot in the in the in the middle uh, from the top uh, with a with a with a high speed camera, and we actually observe the superfluid interface uh, against this uh, periodic checkerboard pattern. And uh, here you can see the checkerboard pattern to be nice and regular and smooth, simply because uh, the superfluid interface above it is very flat. But as soon as we perturb the superfluid interface, as we did uh, here just by abruptly changing the pumping speed of the superfluid, you can see that any waves that are generated on the interface are going to imprint themselves on the pattern. And uh, we can actually use the, the recordings of these different patterns, and we can use a method called Fourier transform profilometry to reconstruct the free interface as a function of space and time. So what can we tell about the waves from these reconstructions? So first, if we look at a snapshot of uh, my height fluctuations at the superfluid interface, we can see that actually the amplitude of the waves is rather tiny. It's a you know, few tens of micrometers. And the structure of these waves is rather complicated because we have some, some dynamics in the radial and in the azimuth direction. So first, we use the Fourier uh, the, 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 we, we use the discrete Fourier transform uh, to decompose these waves, these height fluctuations into individual uh, modes that are characterized by different uh, values of m, which is the azimuthal number, and that's a number that actually counts the periodicity of the wave uh, of the wave in the azimuthal direction. So here you can see a wave that is four crests or four trues as you go around the central vortex. Here you have a wave with, uh, say, uh, the periodicity equal uh, to 12. There is still some structure that is left uncovered. So we do another Fourier transform, this time in time. And now uh, I'm going to show you uh, a two-dimensional spectra, which are a function of the azimuthal number on the horizontal axis and frequency on the vertical axis. You can see that there is actually some structure. These are actually two plots uh, for two different radii, which are marked by uh, this yellow and red lines on the, on the left-hand side figure. And you can see that uh, the structure is radial dependent. The spectrum uh, of excitations gets somehow broader and flatter as you go towards large radii. And most importantly, you can actually see that there is a region, for example, here and here, here and here, where the excitations just simply don't exist. So naturally, we started to think how these excitations are, how this can be explained. And we started to think that there must be some sort of minimum propagating frequency beyond which no excitations can be created. So we teamed up with uh, our, uh, uh, mainly with Sam and with, uh, with, uh, with, with our other uh, theorists uh, within the collaboration. And we started to calculate what is the minimum propagating frequency. 
So we start by assuming an arbitrary background flow. So we have these two unknown velocity components. We consider the dispersion function where the wave number is actually uh, two components. So there is a radial component P and the azimuthal component, which is actually fixed by the chosen uh, value of the azimuthal number M. And we are looking for some propagating solutions of the disper uh, retrieved from the dispersion relation, which are in this form, where there are these two terms that are uh, these frequency shifts due to the, due to the flow. Uh, mainly, there is this dependence on the uh, radial uh, momentum here, and another dependence on the radial momentum is hidden in the dispersion function. So now, when I pick a frequency, this equation usually gives me two real-valued solutions for uh, this uh, P, for the radial uh, wave number. And that gives me you know, two solutions. One of them is radially uh, uh, incoming, and the other one is radially outgoing in, in, in the radial direction. But as I decrease uh, the frequency at which I'm looking for solutions, these uh, two solutions come closer together and eventually uh, merge into one. And if I decrease the frequency further, uh, these solutions, uh, well, I, I get again two solutions, but they will be both complex, which means that my solutions uh, will, be, will have a complex valued wave numbers. Therefore, the waves become evanescent. And the turning point where actually these real valued solutions turned into, into complex valued is our minimum propagating frequency. And it can be found simply by, by looking for extrema of this uh, omega d. We can solve this numerically, and uh, we can calculate the minimum frequency simply as the minimum uh, of, of, of this, this, this found, found, found minimum uh, for the given radius and for the given azimuthal number. However, there are two unknowns, which are the velocity components, right? So what we did is actually that we compared these theoretical predictions with experimental data and we actually browsed uh, the parameter space given by these two velocity components, and we calculated different uh, uh, dependencies of the minimum propagating frequency as a function of the azimuth number. And uh, we chose the one that uh, resulted in the best overlap with experimental data, so with the lowest excited frequencies that we see in the experiment. And by that, we were able to actually assign for each radius the values of vr and v theta that correspond to our experimental observation. We can repeat uh, this procedure for all radii, eventually reconstructing the velocity distribution in our setup. So how are the velocities? So what we found is that across multiple instances, across multiple experimental realizations that were distinct by different uh, frequencies of the propeller of our drive, we found that the radial velocity at the interface was basically equal to zero, which is actually not really surprising because uh, there are other experiments. For example, there is this very nice paper on the anatomy of a bathtub vortex, where in the steady state, actually, uh, the draining is realized in this intricate Ekman layers, which simply we don't see in our experiment. However, the azimuth of velocity has a distinct radial dependence, and you can see it in the panel A on this figure. And uh, we can actually fit our experimental data with a function which has two, uh, uh, two terms. So the first one, the C over R term, is what we are looking for. So this is a circulating velocity profile, uh, which is irrotational because it scales as 1 over R. But there is also this additional term, omega R, that stands for a solid body rotation that we also see in our experimental zone. So the first one, uh, from, the, from the first first term, we can actually determine uh, the number of circulation quanta that are actually uh, formed inside the vortex core. This is plotted in panel B, and uh, I would like to drag your attention to uh, the order uh, at which we are plotting this. So what we found is actually that in our draining vortex uh, experiment, uh, we managed to confine as much as, uh, well, 34,000 circulation quanta in a rather tiny vortex core, which is quite uh, impressive. Uh, the small 
uh, additional rotation in the in the second term can be actually studied by plotting this ratio between the frequency, uh, the rotational frequency, the angular frequency of the solid body rotation that we see on the surface, on the interface of the superfluid, and the frequency of the propeller or the frequency of the drive. And we see in panel C that actually it is rather small. Uh, it maxes at something like 2.3% of the drive frequency. So overall, this means that we were able to actually generate this very extensive quantum vortex flows in helium-2, where the irrotational part of the velocity field dominates over the rotational component. And in other words, we have a vortex where all quantized circulation is actually confined within the vortex scope. And uh, I would like to mention that actually we managed to, to, to achieve this thanks to actually leveraging all the favoring properties of helium-2, which is the finite temperature, where we have a flow of the normal component that we believe uh, is actually stabilizing this kind of vortex configuration. Thanks to the interface and thanks to the emergence of this hollow core, we were actually able to uh, drive the density of our superfluid in the vortex core to directly to zero. And uh, we have also some draining flow Unfortunately, not on the surface, but at least in the bulk, because you know we have an opening and we are actually recirculating helium. So, uh, with this information, uh, we can start looking into the signatures of analog gravity, right? Because we proved that we have indeed a strongly circulating vortex, which is suitable for uh, looking for signatures of some curve space time metrics. So we now redirect our attention to the waves uh, in the radial direction. So here is a rather uh, a busy figure. So let me guide you through that. So let's have a look on panel A, where I'm plotting one of the experimental re uh, realizations. And what I'm plotting here are actually waves uh, that were selected uh, by choosing n equals plus 8 which means these are co-rotating waves uh, with the vortex, which have eight crests as you go around the vortex. And uh, for this azimuth mode, I can calculate, again, the minimum propagating frequency, uh, which I'm plotting here by the red line as a function of the radius now. And uh, this minimum propagating frequency can be here understood as some sort of effective potential, because any wave that is trying to actually breach uh, the minimum propagating frequency, as I told you, becomes evanescent. On top of this, we can actually uh, analytically uh, extend or extrapolate this effective potential by uh, assuming a rather simplified, purely uh, circulating vortex flow uh, with the circulation found experimentally. And as you can see, I mean, these two effective potentials very nicely overlap, at least within our field of view, which is basically limited by the radi radial extent of our checkerboard pattern. Uh, the data that I'm plotting here, it is actually this, this rather intriguing uh, checker, uh, uh, stripy pattern that is formed uh, in our setup. And uh, this is nothing else than standing waves, a whole family of standing waves at different frequencies, which are bound between the effective potential at smaller radii, and the uh, and the rigid wall, so the the, the circular container uh, of that that is you know encapsulating our experimental zone roughly at thirty seven millimeters radius. And uh, what I'm plotting here on the right side of panel A are actually some uh, zoomed in parts on the amplitude of these bound states. So let's have a look on 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 uh, on bound state one. Uh, so this bound state is actually crossing the effective potential somewhere within the field of view. It's marked here by uh, by the by the yellow point. And above this crossing point, we see that the state is propagating. We see this uh, periodic periodic modulation of the wave amplitude. But as soon as the wave crosses the effective potential, we see this nice uh, exponentially decaying uh, tail of the wave. If you look at bound states at higher frequencies, uh, the crossing point is moving towards smaller and smaller radii, 
for example, in, in, in this state B, uh, in this state 2. And uh, as we increase the frequency further, actually this crossing point escapes our field of view. So for example, here the crossing point will be somewhere near 5 millimeters, which is beyond our experimental uh, experimentally accessible uh, range. And we only see uh, the propagating part of the wave. But what we can do is that we can uh, detect where the frequencies of the bound states uh, are in the experiment, and we can compare them against theoretic predictions of bound states that were given by this yellow uh, idealized effective potential. And this is actually marked in, in panel C, where we see a very nice overlap between experiments uh, marked by uh, red points and theory marked by uh, uh, black circles. What I'm plotting on panel B is the same situation, the same occurrence of bound states, but the difference between panel A and panel B is the intensity of the drive. So whereas here, this, this nicely resolved uh, nicely resolved pattern is, is, is for a regime where we only observe a solid core, so a finite depression at the superfluid interface for the in the in the panel B, we see the bound, uh, we see these bound states also in the region where or in the regime where uh, the superfluid uh, vortex forms uh, a, a fully developed hollow core. Now I'm going to change the sign of the azimuth number. So I'm going to focus on uh, n equals minus eight, which is the same periodicity of the wave, but I'm going to consider now counter rotating waves the waves that are counter-rotating with the vortex flow. And in panel A, uh, where I'm considering the, the solid core regime, uh, I can again plot the effective potential. I can plot the analytic uh, extension of this potential now for counter-rotating cases, which does not diverge as I approach a uh, zero radius, but it rather forms a maximum and then it drops to zero. And in this case, as you can see, the potential is still forming some sort of a potential well, if you will, uh, and it allows for the existence of bound states between uh, this part of the potential and the, the, the rigid wall at uh, still at 37 millimeters. So these are the stripe patterns that you can see in here. But the situation is dramatically different for the, for the hollow core regime where this potential can be actually modeled as a very, very uh, shallow peak with a, with, a, with a broad maximum and with a rather early uh, decay towards zero. And uh, because of the nature of this, bound, uh, of this effective potential, we don't really observe any bound states anywhere above it because all the waves are actually allowed to propagate all the way to zero radius which is in our case, they can propagate all the way along the curved interface of the superfluid down to the, to the, to the, to the vortex core. Uh, the excitations that we actually see instead are some rather broad excitations that are living and lingering near this shallow maximum. Uh, they're actually zoomed in, in panel C here. So you can see all these excitations. And uh, it was uh, already identified before that these excitations are actually a uh, uh, mode that correspond to the analog ring down modes of our, of our, of our black hole. And that we believe that we are actually observing some first signatures of uh, this uh, ring down process taking place in a quantum fluid. Moreover, at the crossing point between the effective potential and the zero frequency level is the analog ergo region. And as you can see, we are a bit of unlucky because in panel B, uh, this is actually a data set uh, for uh, obtained at the, at the fastest uh, propeller speed that we were you know, uh, brave enough to, 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 to set up in our, in our, in our, uh, in our setup. And uh, the, the crossing point, so the analog erg region sits only a few millimeters away from uh, our field of view. So hopefully by increasing the uh, this uh, the, the the speed of the propeller, the speed of the drive, we can actually increase the azimuth ve velocity to such an extent that uh, this crossing point will actually appear in our field of view, and we can directly probe the interaction between surface waves 
and this analog ergo region. So uh, I would like to give a uh, sort of an outlook uh, for the for this experiment. So when I started in Nottingham two years ago, the experiment was really in its infancy, and we actually spent quite some time just you know building the hardware. And uh, finally, now we are starting. We started to 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 collect some systematic data, and the data that I just presented to you, we believe, can be said uh, as they are a proof of principle experiment uh, for this new class of gravity simulators in not quantum fluids but rather quantum liquids. And we believe that the use of superfluid helium as a working liquid uh, can be seen as complementary to other well-established systems, for example, Bose-Einstein condensates, which are used for analog gravity simulations for a couple of years already. Moreover, uh, use of quantum liquid uh, of the well-defined interface of superfluid helium or of, or of a quantum liquid interface in, in more general brings some specific advantages. And uh, one of them is actually the possibility for this high precision simultaneous readout uh, of our uh, uh, of, of our excitations, of our interface waves in time and in space. And uh, as I already discussed, we believe that very soon with our experiment, which is actually uh, shown in its glory here on the on the left hand side picture, uh, we'll soon be able to capture directly the black hole ringing, so the the, the ring down modes and uh, perhaps some direct signatures of black hole superradiance, where we need to actually get the effective ergo region to the irrotational part of the velocity field. Uh, looking, you know, in the long term future of this kind of experiments, we actually feel that uh, there is much more to explore in future. For example, uh, the use of superfluid helium as a finite temperature superfluid can uh, actually help us to understand the role of dissipation in superfluids and uh, most importantly in its link to generic holographic theories which predict that you can actually map a dissipative superfluid to uh, some higher dimensional uh, gravitational theories. Moreover, we can use uh, superfluid helium and the uh, interface fluctuations as some sort of simulator of quantum vacuum, provided that we can actually reach temperatures that are low enough to decrease uh, thermal fluctuations beyond quantum fluctuations. And we actually have an experimental proposal how we can probe uh, quantum fluctuations of, uh, of third sound as an analog quantum vacuum for accelerating observers. And uh, finally, because uh, uh, we can directly uh, uh, probe time evolution of surface waves uh, in our system, we can, we can start exploring some explicitly time-depending scenarios, for example, for the use of simulating fundamental non-equilibrium processes, such as uh, inflation in early universe and the dynamical processes preceding or, uh, or following uh, uh, inflation, and perhaps uh, driving the system in a nonlinear regime where we can actually study the onset and development of wave turbulence. And uh, I was actually quite fast, but before I conclude, uh, I would like to mention that actually this is a part of a slightly uh, bigger picture. And uh, our uh, laboratory or our project is actually part of a bigger collaboration called Quantum Simulators for Fundamental Physics, which is actually uh, a consortium that's been established a couple of years ago and funded by the UK National Quantum Technologies Program. And uh, we are actually a team of uh, seven uh, UK universities, which have four dedicated quantum simulators, one for the early universe and three uh, for quantum black holes in Cambridge, uh, Royal Holloway, Nottingham, and St. Andrews. And we are heavily supported and would like to acknowledge, you know, very uh, fruitful collaboration with our theorists at Newcastle King's College and uh, University College London. So in sort of a summary, I would like to just, you know, uh, give you four uh, take-home messages. 
So first one is that the classical and quantum fluids can simulate rotating curved space-time scenarios. Second is that we actually have established a giant draining vortex flow in helium-2, in superfluid helium, to directly use it for the simulations. We have access to interface waves, both in space and time. And by studying their propagation dynamics, we are able to actually link it to an occurrence of tightly confined vortex structures that contain tens of thousands of uh, circulation quanta. And finally, I wanted to uh, show you that uh, this system can be readily used as a, as a, as a simulator uh, of a curved space-time because we already, in the first data that we collected, basically, we started seeing these non-trivial signatures of bound states and the black hole ring down processes in uh, two spatial and one temporal dimensions. So if you'd like to actually read a bit more about the research in say a more coherent way, uh, there is an archive preprint, uh, which we, I think are going to uh, update very soon. So uh, stay tuned, uh, feel free to uh, drop me an email, visit our uh, group website. You can follow us on Instagram. We have a PhD student, Leonardo, who is taking magnificent, magnificent pictures, not only of, of, of our setup, but of also other experiments. Uh, that we do here in Nottingham. And uh, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer to your questions. Yeah, thanks a lot, Patrick. So any questions? Raise your hands. Or maybe just unmute yourself and uh, ask a question. Fine. So um, maybe I just start. Uh, thanks a lot, Patrick, for the nice talk. Um, uh, could I come back to this ring down mode? So um, this is different from the other modes, uh, as it only happens at a single uh, frequency. And you explained uh, this by this uh, orange curve. Um, uh, and um, there's apparently not so many. Um, kind of radius uh, oscillations anymore of these modes can can you maybe say again a bit more why you expect this to be at a single uh, energy i didn't uh, fully yeah sure sure far, so far so 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 basically basically the ring down modes are some sort of a characteristic frequencies at which a perturbed black hole radiates its energy right and the theoretically uh these frequencies can be, can be attributed to you know different azimuthal modes so different 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 values of of of, of m and uh, for each azimuthal mode the corresponding ring down mode is uh or the frequency of the ring down mode is the frequency at which uh the mode can actually propagate fully from zero radius, so from our analog black hole towards infinity. So the, the, the ring down mode will always sit uh, at the maximum of our effective potential. And what we see here are actually not a single ring down mode, unfortunately, but a couple of them mm -hmm. uh, or a couple of excitations. Mm -hmm. And this might be partly due to uh, you know, the fact that you know, the, our effective potential is not as smooth as we would wish to be. So, so these, these, these fluctuations are actually given by the, the, the detection method, the, 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 the fitting of, of, of our radial and azimuthal velocities to the excitation spectra. But uh, this is still actually an ongoing uh, a research, an ongoing initiative in our, in our group. We are trying to actually rerun the experiment to, to shed more light onto this and hopefully capture this ring down modes you know, in a more uh, clear way. And uh, uh, yeah, so there is there is there is a actually an experimental observation from our previous experiments, so from the from the water tank where these ring down modes were actually quite clearly observed, and uh, one of their signatures is actually that their amplitude is actually quite constant. Mm -hmm. They are they are, they are not really radial dependent. So the fact that we actually see these these stride patterns. It is actually clear indication that these are these are actually not ring down modes. This is something else, and uh, they are actually perfectly consistent with the standing waves that you know are creating some nodes at at specific radii.
Okay, thank you. So there's a question in the chat. How do you stabilize the temperature? Oh yeah, uh, so this is actually a pumped uh, helium cryostat. So we can just stabilize the pressure and we have a PID loop that is stabilizing the pressure and uh, you know, uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a rather 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 simple stuff. Uh, naturally, having a having a having the system actually enclosed in a directly pump crowd stat has its drawbacks. One of them is, or you know, the, the the biggest one is that you know helium evaporates. So during the course of our cool down, you know, the level of 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 helium in the experimental zone drops, and uh, this limits our our uh, experimental time. We can we can, you know, collect our our data for maybe two hours uh, per, per, per cool down. So we actually are trying now to transition into more controlled uh, uh, setups where we just use a closed cell uh, filled with, with, with liquid helium that is going to be immersed in you know, some externally cooled, uh, that will be cooled externally. So either by, by a helium bath or uh, by some uh, dry, dry system. Okay, thanks. So I have a follow-up question. So um, if you, what changes with uh, temperature in helium physics, which affects uh, your measurements? Uh, well, <clears throat> probably the, the, the most important factor is, is, is dissipation, right? And the amount of, of normal component, uh, damping of Kelvin waves, might be also a factor. Uh, at lower temperatures, I would expect that you know Kelvin waves are more more less damped, so so more pronounced. Question is what this is going to do with the stability of the of that dense uh, vortex cluster in the center. And uh, so one way of how we are actually looking into this is that you know by decreasing the dissipation by this de decreasing this you know linear term uh, or yeah, by this, this this linear dissipation terms in in the in the wave equation we actually give rise to some perhaps nonlinear effects that would not be visible for example in much highly damped uh, systems such as water but you may I ask a question could you sure. please could you please control the amplitude of these surface waves? And if you can, I mean, what happens if you increase the amplitude that uh, the system becomes nonlinear? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you, Ladik. Uh, so at the moment, we actually, so at the moment, the way how uh, all these waves appear in our system is simply due to some mechanical noise because we are spinning the propeller in the cryostat, which is inducing some broadband mechanical noise. And uh, basically, this mechanical noise feeds the eigen mode. So this is why we can actually see very clearly uh, the bound states when the bound states are supposed to be uh, or are predicted to 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 be stabilized in this system, and when we see uh, the, the 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 ring ring down modes when the ring down mode is actually the the the, the one that that should be dominating the system. Uh, in terms of control of this amplitude, we would probably have to transition to some different systems and. Uh, for example, you can you can you can start of uh, thinking of changing the, the the way how we are feeding the superfluid into your experimental zone. For example, using a fountain effect pump. Uh, but yeah, that's actually something that can be. Uh, we are we are we are we are, we are, we are considering it right, but uh, it it will be probably on our agenda in the future. Maybe if you change the temperature. Then, because there will be a lot less of the normal component, I mean, the, sh the waves will be much more sharp, and you can see some kind of interesting nonlinear effects. Mm -hmm. That might be also a possibility, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. A very nice work. I congratulate you. Thanks. Thanks, Ladik. Uh, any more questions? Ah, oh, there is a question by Davide. Yeah. How do the results? Just, I just go ahead. Of... Yeah, I can't see the question, but yeah, Davide, so if you have a question. 
So I can read uh, Davide's question. Uh, Dima's question related to mine. How do these results change when the experiment is performed at temperatures higher than the lambda point? Well, uh, if you go above lambda point, uh, your you know your transition from from superfluid to normal helium and uh, helium. Well, you you start so because we are operating you know in a glass crust that we can't really pressurize the system, so helium starts to boil and actually appearance. Uh, of 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 the bubbles basically uh, disables the detection method that we use because what we need to see is some sort of smooth variation in the some smooth deformation of the of the of the checkerboard pattern that we that we place uh, underneath the superfluid interface. So any appearance of bubbles would actually render our detection method uh, uh, non-working. Yeah, well, so I have a, a follow-up question again. Uh, right, so how long does it take you to make a measurement? Well, because you can have um, uh, some sort of metastable helium where it doesn't boil. Uh, and well, when it's the temperature is below four kelvins, but above lambda transition, and say the gas pressure is one bar, uh, then... Uh, the, the helium won't boil, so but it, it won't last long, this state, but you can still... So... It does it take you long to make uh, one snapshot of spectrum? So actually, you know, uh, what, 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 what we need to do uh, is that we need to actually drive the system. So all the data that I've shown, where uh, we, we check that this is actually a steady state, and the usual experimental protocol, if I remember correctly, was actually to start the propeller, onset the vortex, drive it for 60 seconds, and they then take a, a video or recording of the of the interface, which usually is, I think, we are collecting 20-second uh, long videos at 200 FPS so that we have you know, good enough resolution for both high and low frequencies. So I could imagine that you know trying to reproduce this in helium one would require actually to have you know helium one without boiling for 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 at least eighty seconds, which might be a bit complicated. Also because you know as soon as you start the propeller, you are actually you start to uh, you start to generate uh, dissipate some heat in the system. I mean, what happens? between the propeller and our flow conditioner must be a uh, very turbulent right because we are actually stirring the flow uh, mechanically and uh, i could imagine that you know this would actually induce some boiling bubbles in in helium 1 but i mean if we need to 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 run measurements in a in a in a classic fluid we can still you know get to say back to back to our water water experiment uh, where we, okay, we we get large dissipation, but we we can also probe uh, larger wavelengths, which are less damped by 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 viscosity. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Any more questions? So there is one more question in the chat, if I can see from from Andre. Do you think it is feasible to somehow simulate space-time surrounding the more general charge rotating black holes using superfluids as well? That's a very good question, and I'm not sure if I actually can answer it. Uh, so I can't imagine what can we do to our hydrodynamic, you know, uh, setup. To actually modify the the superfluid flow, the, the flow at the, at the at the at the interface, so that it actually can actually you know simulate a charged black hole. But uh, it is definitely a good suggestion for 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 maybe for future. So at the moment we are actually trying to uh, get closer to the to the to the exact analog with the with the curved black hole. And when we get there, we can probably then, you know, think of 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 some some future future enhancements. Okay, maybe you have time for another question. Uh, 
Um, so I have a generic question. So you said that PCs are now quite well established simulators of uh, curved uh, gravity space. Uh, so are there any advantages of uh, liquid helium? Well, uh, one of the advantages is uh, that uh, we are probing or well, what we wanted to what, what we wanted to actually uh, prove also by these experiments is that uh, you know superfluid helium can work in a slightly different regime. It can probe a slightly different parameter space because we are operating at a finite temperature, for example. So we actually have some, although low, but some dissipation in in place, which is you know different from from Bose-Einstein condensates. Uh, we can generate uh, much larger systems than the Bose-Einstein condensates. So uh, this helps us, for example, in terms of uh, you know studying future studies of turbulence, we can actually probe larger uh, spans of, of, of uh, length scales uh, in these systems. And uh, the fact that we have the interface gives us a very good uh, uh, way how to simulate or how to probe uh, time-dependent uh, scenarios, right? If you have a Bose-Einstein condensate, the way to probe some time dependence is actually to repeat the experiment over and over and imagining it at, at different times. Here we can actually directly, directly, you know, observe the superfluid as it evolves in time. Okay, so it's real time observation. Okay, so any, any more questions? We're close to the hour now. Well, if if not, so thanks a lot, Patrick, and thanks a lot, everyone. Our next uh, webinar is in two weeks' time, so we're hoping to see you there again. Thank you.